Hi everyone, welcome back. In part two of the video lessons for this week, um, we're going to slow things down a little bit. And uh, in this section, we're going to focus primarily on drawing commands, talking about colors. And as we go along, we're going to unpack some of that syntax we started to get introduced in uh, the previous video when we wrote our first program. Now, I went ahead here and I'm uh, I'm on the uh, P5.js web editor. Uh, and just, just to recap, you know, how we create a new program as we go file, new, right? <clears throat> and uh, oops, and then we always want to make sure that we, uh, we, we give our program a name right before we get started. Uh, so we're going to go here and uh, give this a name, right? Uh, and then we can save it uh, just to make sure that it's actually being saved on our, on our account here. Okay. Awesome. And then uh, once we've saved the program, uh, normally autosave should be on for you, uh, which is always a good idea just to make sure things get saved as you go. Uh, but once you've renamed your program and saved it, um, you should be good to go. Okay. So like I said, uh, we're going to build a simple little example uh, in this video, uh, focusing a little bit more on some of the options we have for drawing, unpacking the syntax, and talking also about how color is being represented in P5. <clears throat> so um, one of the, let, let's start by talking about these two code sections here that we have, uh, setup and draw. We introduced them in the previous video as a section of code that will run once in the beginning and a section of code that will repeat over and over again. Okay? So what even is a section of code? Well, in JavaScript, sections of code are being delimited using this character, the curly bracket. Okay? Uh, you probably never use that character in most of your daily life, but when you're programming, you're going to use curly brackets all the time. And curly brackets are always going to have a similar meaning, which means they're going to de delimitate the start and the end of, of a section of the program. So here we're talking about our setup section, right? And then it's beginning and ending over here. And you can see the editor, if you put your cursor after a closing curly bracket, it will conveniently highlight its matching open curly bracket. Okay, so if I put my cursor here, it's highlighting the matching one. So we can see that these curly brackets are defining two distinct code sections, right? These sections have names here. Um, the parentheses we'll come back to, but parentheses um, indicate the, that we are, what, what these code sections actually are in programming. Um, they're called functions, okay? Spoiler alert, we have the keyword function over here. So what we have in our program when we start off is we have a function called setup and we have a function called draw. In programming, a function is basically a bundle, right, that contains a bunch of lines of code inside of it, uh, and it's given a name. Okay? In a few weeks, we're going to expand on functions, and we're going to learn how to write our own, create custom functions from scratch. But in the world of P5.js, every program needs to have these two functions in the beginning. And the, the body of a function, the contents of a function, is always going to be delimit delimited by these curly brackets. So that means that if we want to put, put some code inside setup, right, or inside draw, we're going to create some space in between the open and close curly brackets. Okay. <clears throat> so first little bit of syntax that I think is really worth uh, mentioning, and we'll keep revisiting the curly brackets. As I mentioned, we're going to use them in other different places, but they're always going to have the same general purpose, which is kind of like bookends, right? Here's the start and the end of something. Now, moving on to the, the second line of our program here that we have, um, we have something called create canvas. Now, create canvas also happens to be a function, right? The difference here between setup and create canvas is that in setup here, we are defining the contents of a function. We're like writing the code that goes inside. Whereas when we use create canvas, we're simply invoking, we're calling an existing function. Um, all of P5.js is essentially a collection of of functions and objects that make up this, what's called a library, right? So it's a bunch of pre-written functions that other people have already cooked up for you that you can use. That's what we don't have to reinvent the wheel for every single little thing that we're trying to do. So create canvas here when we hit play, right? Builds something called a canvas object for us. And this is, gives us a, a surface that we can draw onto inside the browser. And uh, lines of code where we call a function are always going to follow the general similar syntax. We're going to have, here's the name of the function we want to use. Or in the beginning, um, I, I sometimes will use the word command. Okay, that's a good way to think about it. A function is like a command we're using in our program. We're going to say, here's the name of that function. Then we're going to open the parentheses, and we're going to put in 
if, if it applies, we're going to put in any number of what's called parameters to that function. So what those parameters do is they allow us to specify how we want the function to behave, right? So when we use create canvas, we want to be able to say, here's the width and height of our canvas, right? We could change these parameters to different numbers, different values, and we'll see it changes the size of the canvas. Okay? Different functions will have um, different, different roles for these parameters. Uh, in programming, a lot of the time, the parameters are just going to be numbers. So in the beginning, it's going to take a little bit of getting used to sort of, you know, knowing what the order of these parameters are and what their significance is, because they're all just going to look like numbers to you, at least in the beginning. Okay? So one of the ways that we can get around this uh, is we can use something called a comment. So a comment is basically a line of code that we can put into our program that's only there for the reader, only there for the, the person programming or the person reading the code, and that's going to just get ignored by, uh, by JavaScript, by the program. So comments start with two forward slashes, okay? and you can see it's grayed out the line. And then we could say here, um, you know, create. We could put in a little uh, reminder, right? We could say something like, you know, this is going to be the width and the height, right, for the for create canvas. Okay? So comments. Um, so this gives us like the size of our drawing area, right? So comments are just text that doesn't follow any kind of syntax. We can write whatever we want inside a comment. <clears throat> so we could, for example, say, you know, runs once in the beginning using a comment and then runs over and over again after that as a comment above draw. So with comments, you can start to annotate your code. Uh, and it's a good idea to get into the habit of doing this for two reasons. Um, one is it kind of forces you to think about what you're doing a little bit. And if you can leave some comments, you're kind of like explaining your, to yourself as you go, which I find helpful. Uh, and also, they're useful for uh, your future self, right? If you go back to some older programs you've written, especially as things get a little bit more complex, you may not remember exactly what it is you were thinking. Uh, and with comments, you can leave little clues for somebody, either yourself or somebody else who's going to read your program to try to understand what you were thinking about and try to figure out you know, what, you, what your goals were and so forth. So if, so, if you're doing something that's kind of clever and not obvious, usually putting a little comment explaining it is a good idea. Um, and what I'll do in the examples that I create for this course uh, is I'll put as many comments as I can, just kind of giving you some explanations as well. I won't put them all in when we're doing the videos, but in the posted examples, you notice there's usually a few more comments in there. Okay. Uh, so comments are just uh, lines that we can use to basically leave little notes inside our programs. Okay. <clears throat> all right. Um, so we have the curly brackets that define code sections. Uh, we can call functions using their names and then using parentheses with some parameters and which parameters we're going to use again is going to depend on the function parameters are always separated by a comma right so you'll see that programming is very dogmatic it's very rigorous the syntax you just have to learn it in the beginning uh, but thankfully the syntax is actually not that complex compared to even the language like you know english which has much more complicated grammar much more complicated syntax um, overall i think javascript is, is pretty forgiving and it, the syntax once you learn it it's pretty minimal okay. um, another little piece of syntax is this semicolon here at the end of the, the line of code here now uh, one thing that's a little bit of a dirty secret in javascript is that the semicolons um they're they're actually optional like if i leave this out uh, the program doesn't break it still runs okay. uh, but the the role of the semicolon is as uh, in some cases in, in many cases it's kind of like the dot at the end of the sentence um, in certain languages, uh, semicolons don't exist at all. Uh, in other languages, like C or Java, uh, you have to put your semicolon, otherwise the program just won't run. JavaScript is kind of like in the middle. Uh, it has them because in certain very obscure edge cases, you really need to put them in to make sure your program runs correctly. Um, but if you forget one or two over here and there, uh, it's not going to be a big deal. I just like to introduce them as kind of a good habit, especially if you plan to learn other languages in the future which if you get into programming, you will, trust me, because not there's not a one language fits all. Uh, many languages are good at different things. So getting into this habit of putting a, your dot at the end of the sentence or your semicolon at the end of a line of code uh, is a good idea. Now, they don't show up at the end of every line. Like we don't have a semicolon here, for example. So these are just the lines that are inside a section here where we call a, kind of like a single command or something like this. We'll, we'll tell the, the, the program that this is the end of the line by putting in our little semicolon. But if you forget one or two here and there in JavaScript, um, it's not the end of the world.
All right. So in the previous video, um, we saw that you know we can create a canvas. Um, let's make our canvas. Actually, I like to make it use up the size available. So instead of 400 by 400, we're going to replace these numbers with um, variables. Now, these are built-in variables. Um, we'll expand on this concept of variables next week. But for this week, we're just going to use a few of these pre-built variables. Uh, we have window width and window height, which represent the size available to us okay? uh, of this little preview window or whatever the size of the browser window is. Uh, so this way we can fill up the space available. Uh, and notice here I'm, I'm capitalizing the middle, um, the middle uh, letter here. Uh, this is very important. Okay? Capitalization matters in, uh, in JavaScript. So a lowercase letter is not the same character as an uppercase uh, letter. So notice that if I write it like this, uh, first of all, it changes color. Uh, the editor picks up on certain keywords. Uh, so this is not the same, right? And then it's it's not going to know what you're talking about. Um, so pay attention when I capitalize things uh, in these examples, and you just make sure you follow the same capitalization scheme. Uh, and we'll talk about this thing called the reference in a minute, uh, where you'll be able to look up, you know, what is the correct way of writing those things. Um, you don't have to always necessarily memorize everything. But usually by convention, when there's two words lumped together, like window width or window height, um, the second word will get capitalized. And this is just for readability, right? You'll notice this is much easier to read window width than when it's a single single bunch of uh, lowercase letters, for instance. So that's why they do it. Uh, but the important point here is that the, the uppercase versus lowercase is actually important when we're programming in JavaScript. So we just have to follow, make sure we use the right capitalization where appropriate. Okay. So we're going to make our canvas here uh, fill the window. And in the previous example, we drew a circle. So we used a function called circle. So just like create canvas, the circle function, we're going to follow the same recipe, right? We're going to open a parenthesis, the same syntax. And then we're going to go in and put in some, some parameters for the circle command. Okay. So in the previous example, we said the first two parameters were going to be a coordinate. And we'll un unpack that idea in a second. So let's put in, um, I don't know, like 100 and uh, 200. And then the last parameter was going to be a diameter. Okay, so let's put in, uh, I don't know, 250 for this one. Uh, and here we could put a little comment reminding us of the, the coordinates, right? We could say circle, we have x, y, and diameter. Okay. Yeah. So three numbers. Right? They look the same, they just look like three numbers, but they have different meaning depending on their order in the sequence of parameters. Okay? So if I hit play here, you can see, oh, we got a circle over there. I kind of like, let's, let's move it over a little bit so it's not cut off. Okay, so, so these coordinates, right? They're coordinates uh, in pixels. This is the pixel is gonna be our basic unit of, of measure when we're programming inside P5.js. And the first important thing to know about the coordinate system is that the zero, zero point is up here. <coughs> Excuse me, in the top left, in the top left of our, of our canvas. Um, so unlike some other coordinate systems that you may get used to, where by default, maybe zero, zero is in the center, or maybe zero, zero is at the bottom left, right? Um, in P5.js, in this world, zero, zero is at the top left. So just something to keep in mind. Now, um, as you as you go into positive numbers, right uh, on the x-axis. So, um, in case you don't know, right, the x-axis runs horizontally, and the y-axis runs uh, vertically, right. So this is x and y, uh, and we'll see eventually we can do 3D in P5.js, and we'll add a third axis, the z-axis, and that one will go like in and out of the screen. But we'll worry about that later. Um, so x is horizontal, y is vertical. And because zero, zero is up here in the corner, it means that when we have positive values of Y, right, we're actually going down and positive values of X uh, are taking us to the right side. Okay? So if I increase this number, right, my circle is moving down, right, because I'm increasing Y because zero is at the top. So that's a little counterintuitive on the Y axis, right? If we put zero here, right, our circle is right at the top, whereas the bottom of the screen, right, is going to be equal to the height of our window. So here we could either say window height, or we could also use another built in keyword, just called height, which is going to represent the actual height of our canvas, okay? um, which may not always be the same as our the height of our window, right? Let's say we made our canvas a fixed size here. 
uh, height is going to always be the height of our canvas. So let's not get too um, stuck into these pre-built variables here. I'm going to go back and put in a number. So uh, zeros at the top, right? Higher numbers are at the bottom and the zero, zero coordinate is in the top left corner. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, the other thing we did uh, in the previous example uh, is we can also animate this, right? If we replace one of these numbers by something called a variable, uh, today we're going to use mouse X again, but we'll see next week we can create our own variables and, you know, use create programmatic animation and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, this circle now animates, right? We've changed its coordinate dynamically. So every time draw does a one frame of animation, it will check what is the value of mouse X and it will draw the circle in that location. And we can do the same for mouse Y if we want to do just a little bit more fun than just drawing static shapes in this example. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Now there's many more uh, drawing commands available than drawing a circle, as you may imagine. And uh, so how do we know what's what's available? And more importantly, how do we know what these parameters are here? Um, I, you know, eventually you're going to memorize some of them. But when you're programming, uh, don't worry in the beginning, the goal is not to memorize everything. Um, the goal is going to be more to understand the logic and the, the syntax and the structure. And you'll be able to refer to something called the reference, which is the documentation for P5.js. And as you're learning this, this new library, um, you'll be able to, to, to look up what these functions are that you can use and look up what are the expected parameters that you need to provide. Um, so let's take a look at this uh, this reference. Um, you can Google it, or if you're inside a, a sketch here, in under the Help menu, you can click the Reference button, which we're going to do right now. So Reference takes you to this page on the p5js.org website, um, which is basically the documentation for the core p5js library. Um, it's very well formatted, uh, and it's organized into kind of like different sections over here. For example, we're going to jump into the Shape section. Um, which gives us an assortment here of different drawing commands that we have available. Okay. Uh, we already saw circle. Let's click on that. If you click on a command uh, or a function, uh, the reference is, is done really well. So feel free to like poke around, explore. Uh, you're never going to get too lost. And uh, there's usually a good explanation of what the function does. Uh, a good little example of what the function is doing over here. And... Um, <clears throat> And, uh, and then an explanation of the syntax, right? This is the important part. So the syntax is telling us, right, X, Y, and diameter, right? This is, this is how the circle function works. Okay? Um, what, about, what about a rectangle, right? We have another command here called rect, which is short for a rectangle. Now, unless you know about the reference, right, there's a few different ways you could imagine representing rectangles using numbers, right? You could say, coordinate of one corner and then size and height, or you could say coordinate of one corner and then coordinate of the opposite corner, for example. All, both of those would be valid ways of representing a rectangle, uh, but uh, P5.js just uses one in particular. So uh, in this case, P5.js uh, happens to, to use this model where you can say X, Y, and then the width and the height of the rectangle. Right? Uh, it will explain to you that the, the top left corner <coughs> of the rectangle is the coordinate, the default, but this is something that you can change using another command called rect mode, which we'll talk about in a sec. Um, and there's some optional parameters as well, right? So if you don't specify a height, it will interpret the width the same to make a square. Uh, and then these allow you to like round the edges, for example. So there's a number of like optional parameters. So every, every function will, will behave slightly differently based on what it's trying to do. Okay? But they follow the same syntax, right? They have the name of the function, they have a parenthesis, and then they have a list of parameters separated by commas, and then close parenthesis. So if we wanted to say, change this to a rectangle, right? we could say, okay, now we know a rectangle is X, Y, and then width. So this would allow us to draw a rectangle instead. Notice the top left corner of my rectangle is what's, is what's kind of like lining up with my mouse cursor, with my coordinate, because in the world of P5.js, the, the rectangles are corner mode by default. Um, and then we could specify, you know, different different sizes here just to show what we can do. So this is a rectangle, right, of a different size. 
So we have these access to all these commands that we can use to draw stuff. You can explore them. Uh, we'll we'll do a line later on in this video as well. But you know, there's other shapes that are pretty self-explanatory. Um, there's other commands that change how the the shapes are going to be interpreted, right? So we'll get into rectangle mode here for a second. So these don't really draw anything in and of themselves, but they will affect how the drawing commands will work. So for example, rectangle mode has uh, a few different parameters that we can pass to it, right? It can either be corner, corners, uh, center, or radius. Okay, so the default is corner. Uh, let's see what happens if we change it to center. Okay? So the rectangle mode right, is a command that we use before drawing a rectangle. And then we can say, uh, instead of corner, I'm going to say center. I notice in the reference, it said center all, all, uh, all caps. So I got to put in center all caps. Uh, I got to follow the capitalization. And now uh, the difference is that this rectangle is now being uh, centered in the coordinate that we provided as opposed to having that coordinate be it's uh, the top left corner. Right? Let's switch back and forth between them. Uh, by the way, a useful um, use of the comments that we can do in addition to putting, um, well, now my comment is uh, a little bit out of date here. Uh, we could put the definition of a rectangle if we wanted to, um, or just, just leave it out for now. Uh, a useful um, usage of comments is we can use comments also to take a line out of our program. So here, if I want to try without rect mode center, I can do something called commenting it out, right? I just put a comment in front of it, and now we have the default rect mode corner. And if I want to bring it back, I can just get rid of the comment. So this is a, a useful thing to do. In fact, there's something you can do in the editor um, <clears throat> if you select a section and then do control forward slash, you can comment out entire sections of code or uncomment them together. Okay, so there's a few uh, fun keyboard shortcuts you can explore with the uh, editor. But um, this is also another way that we can use comments is just to take things in and out of the program without actually deleting them in case we want to put them back later. Okay. Uh, so let's go back to the rectangle mode center. And, uh, you know, we could still, we could draw a square like this as well. If we put 200 by 200, uh, or we could just go a single value. Remember, some of these parameters are optional. <clears throat> All right. Uh, and just like we did in the, the previous uh, example demo, right, we could, let's say we move background, remember, to setup. Right? Then we can have a sketch that will build upon what we already, uh, what we've drawn in previous frames as opposed to always starting with a clear uh, clear background, which you know sometimes you want one over the other. Uh, this can be a fun little way in the beginning when you're learning out a program to explore creating like very complex looking images just by building over time instead of um, having to create every single element of an image within the duration of the frame. So that can be something very fun to play with, uh, especially in the beginning. Okay. All right, so we have different uh, different drawing commands that we can play with. Um, we saw circle, rectangle, there's a bunch of others. Uh, you can also draw simple points. You can draw lines. For example, a line in P5.js is uh, defined by two points, right? So we could say, let's put a line um, from 0, 0 to mouse X, mouse Y. So that would look something like this, right? So now I'm drawing a line. Uh, one of the corners of that line is zero zero, which is in the top right, top left corner, and then the other end of that line is following my mouse cursor. So just another way of thinking about uh, drawing. Okay? So you can draw individual lines, you can draw single points, you can draw triangles, more complex shapes, so on and so forth. Okay, so I'll leave that to you to explore these different drawing commands. Um, what I want to talk about now a little bit more is uh, is colors. Okay. So, so far, um, we talked about in last video, right, we had this number 220 here. We said this means this is a gray value, and we didn't really explain what that means. Um, so let's unpack this, and let's talk about how colors uh, are being handled in P5. Okay. So certain commands like background, and we also had, you know, we have uh, something like fill, right? We said we can have a, a black fill if we wanted to, and we can have a a white stroke, for example, right? Uh, so we saw in the previous examples, we have commands that don't really draw anything in of themselves, but that affect what happens afterwards. Okay? 
So uh, these commands like background fill and stroke take in a color as their parameter. And there are multiple different ways that colors are being represented inside P5, and it's good to be familiar with them in the beginning. Um, so the first way colors are being represented is just with a single number. So that would be a number between 0 and 255. Okay? And this is a single uh, gray level where 0 is black. So this is black, and 255 is the other end of the scale. It's white. Okay. So that's one way that you can represent colors, uh, or in this case, just gray levels, just with a number. Why 255? Uh, just as an aside, that's because 255 is the biggest number that fits inside. Uh, largest number that fits inside a byte, which is a unit of copy of, uh, of data storage inside the computer, a single byte, okay? just because of the way bytes are uh, represented inside the computer. So that's the biggest number that fits in there. So you'll see that number 255 come up uh, often in programming. Uh, another way to represent colors is using three numbers for, um, for RGB values, or red, green, and blue. <coughs> so if we do this, uh, let's say we go add some more parameters, now we have uh, RGB as our colors. Okay, so this is going to be full red, yeah, and then no green and no blue. So you can kind of mix in there and you can come up with your own color values um, like so. Okay, so we have RGB. Uh, so let's go back to maybe something less intense than bright red here, and I'm going to stick to my boring gray background for this, uh, this video. Um, and we see down here, we have another way we can specify colors. So if we put in single quotes, right, what happens is we're, we're putting in something called a string, we're putting in text, and we can use named colors inside P5 as well. And uh, the editor here will do a little trick for us. This, this character is not actually there. This is only part of the P5.js editor. Uh, and it gives us a little like color picker that we can use to also change the value of the color uh, like this. So if we do that, what's going to happen is, uh, oh, we didn't put it in the right place. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So if you if you play with the color picker, so example, I try to change the stroke to red, right? You see that now instead of red, it's put in RGB, and then it's put in the right combination of colors for this particular color. So you can rely on this color picker. That could be a way to just set specific colors. Here, there we go. Now it's in the right place. Uh, you can also set alpha values, transparency, right? So if we set transparency, it adds a fourth number after red, green, and blue. And transparency is a number between zero and one. So you could have a semi-translucent. Wow, this is ugly. Okay, let's, uh, let's improve on this a little bit. Uh, you know, you, I'm sure you've played with a color picker before. So just be careful uh, that the the single quotes here are respected. So it's a it's a little brittle, but you know here I, I have this translucent purple with a solid white uh, outline that I can play with. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So that's another way that we can specify colors. Um, we can bring up the the color picker um, and just specify colors like this, or we can put them by hand, or we could use name colors. Uh, the name colors are simply um, HTML color names, right? So if you want to see a list of them, uh, you can go like this. And uh, these are all, all valid names that you can use inside the color picker. Uh, so for example, you know, we could put uh, dark magenta. Uh, this would be a valid color name. Um, yeah. And if we didn't type it from scratch, the, the editor doesn't always pick up to add that little, uh, that little color picker over here. Sometimes you have to refresh, but here's our dark magenta. Uh, so that's another way of specifier, specifying color. Uh, finally, the last part I want to touch on when it comes to color, uh, let's go back to just using simple white here, uh, is uh, you can also change the, the color mode. So there's a few different color modes in P5. Uh, if we go and look at color and search for color mode right here, uh, so color mode can be either um, RGB in the default. Uh, we also have a mode called HSB that we can use, which is hue, saturation, and brightness. So that's another way of thinking about representing colors. Um, 
And uh, we can also have HSL, which is hue saturation lightness, which is very, very close. Um, so depending on what you're trying to do, we might use one mode over the other. Uh, and in future example, we're gonna, exp we're gonna use the most appropriate mode. Uh, for example, if you wanna create a, a rainbow, right? Having a color in, expressed in uh, hue saturation brightness might be useful because you can vary the hue. Uh, if you're looking for a very specific RGB color, maybe the RGB mode is easier to work with. Uh, and you can change those uh, anywhere you want in your program by using color mode. And the default is RGB, but you can also use HSB. Okay. So different color modes uh, are available. <clears throat> All right. Let's go back to uh, black. Now, in addition to changing the... Uh, changing the fill and the stroke color of the shapes that you're going to draw, uh, you can also turn off one or the other. And this is done using the no fill or no stroke command. For example, if I say no fill, right? So no fill is an example of a command that doesn't take any parameters. You just say, here's the command I wanna use, and you still have to put the parentheses, but it doesn't need any more instructions. This will simply say no fill, right? So now you can draw shapes that have an outline, but not a fill and vice versa. All right. So this is colors in a nutshell in P5.js. Uh, finally, before we, uh, we move on from this, um, the last important thing I want to point out is, uh, is this idea that the order in which we put the, the lines of code in our program matters. Uh, and also these, uh, these state altering commands like no fill and stroke, Right? They will affect everything from that point forward. Uh, so for example, let's add a circle back into our sketch. Now I'm gonna draw a circle in the center of my window. Okay? We're gonna explain that a little bit more next week when we dive into variables. Uh, but in addition to mouse X and mouse Y, we have access to these two built-in variables called width and height. So I could say, if I wanna draw a circle at width and height, and let's say I'm gonna make it 150 pixels in diameter, Let's say that's gonna draw my circle. See it's down here at the bottom. Let's say I wanna draw it in the center of my window. Okay. I'm gonna simply take the width and I'm gonna divide that number by two. So when we're programming to divide is a forward slash and we'll say divide by two. So that creates kind of like a fraction, right? So this is width divided by two and then height divided by two. So whatever that number is, it will cut in half and you can see now my circle is centered okay. and I can draw on top of it course, I can draw my, uh, my rectangle. Let's bring the canvas back into draw here, just so we don't have all this trail of shapes to distract us. Okay, so um, brought the background back into draw here. <laughs> so I want to emphasize here before we wrap up this second part that the order of operations matter. What that mean by this is that, uh, let's say um, we go here and then so if we draw, um, if we set no fill and no stroke, right, it will affect all the shapes from that point forward. So rectangle and circle both have uh, no fill and no stroke. I could go back in here and put in a, let's say a white fill for my rectangle. I'm just not trying to be a, oh, sorry, fill, not no fill. Now my, my uh, sorry, my circle has a white fill and my um, rectangle right, has no fill. So these commands right, affect everything that comes afterwards. Uh, let's bring back, let's say a black fill for the rectangle. So we can also demonstrate the order of operation. Uh, the other thing that's important when we're programming again is that the order in which we put the commands is the order in which they will run. So if I draw the rectangle first, right, it, it gets drawn. And then if I draw the circle after, it gets drawn on top of that. So if we wanna reverse the order in which these things uh, appear, unlike in a, an environment like Photoshop or Illustrator, we can't just change the layers. We have to think about the order in which we draw our shapes. So I could say, let's move this after the circle, just to demonstrate, right? So now the circle is being drawn first, and then the rectangle is being drawn second, and we can see it appears on top. Okay? So the lesson from that is that as we write our program, right, the order in which we draw our, do our different functions is important. Uh, the program is gonna go through these lines of code one at a time and it's gonna execute what it sees as it runs into it. Uh, for example, if I end my draw 
function on background 120. Remember, background just puts a splash of gray over everything. Here's what happens, right? Now I see nothing because even though I drew a circle and I drew a rectangle, over here I just erased it all by splashing the entire canvas with gray. Okay? So this is something to keep in mind as we are learning how to program. Just remember that the order of instructions matters. Um, and then in some cases we have these mode altering commands like fill, stroke, rectangle modes. These commands basically take effect from now on. So it means as soon as you put that command in, it will affect every other related command afterwards uh, until you change your mind. Okay, so for example, here I'm setting a, a fill of white, draw the circle. If I drew other shapes in between, these would also be white until I change my mind here and then change the fill to black. And then every shape from that point forward will be black until told otherwise. <clears throat> okay. Um, so with that, I think we can conclude uh, part two of this week's video. So just to recap real quick, we unpacked some of the syntax of our program. We said every P5 sketch is going to have a setup and a draw function. These are created, these are delimited by the curly brackets, right? We have the curly brackets over here. Within those functions, we can call other functions that are triggering different sections of code for us. Um, and we put a focus this week on the functions that help us draw things on the canvas. We learned about circle, rectangle, colors, uh, functions that change colors. Um, and we also learned about the reference, right? So the reference, again, very important. When you're starting to program, you should almost always have that reference open next to you somewhere you have access to it so that you don't have to be always remembering like, oh, how do I, how do I do rectangle again? Like what was the parameters? You can always refer back to this. That's why it's there. That's why it's called a reference. Over time, you will memorize these things. But in the beginning, it's perfectly number, normal to be looking things up and probably a good idea also to just, just skim over this reference. I mean, we're not going to dive into every single command in this course that are available in P5, but you can see there's quite a bit of things you can do with P5 without adding libraries and just getting an idea of what's to come just by skimming through it um, could be a good idea. Okay. All right. So with that, uh, we're going to leave this program here. I'll see you in the final part for this week. We're going to talk a little bit about 2D transformations uh, and then wrap it up for this week's lecture. See you there.